thank you very much for having me. I've uh, been giving this talk around the country, and so I'm glad to have an opportunity to actually deliver it here in town. Uh, and before I start, though, I always like to just get a sense of where my audience is at. You know, I can kind of adjust the, you know, how advanced or, you know, if I have to get more basic. So I just like to do a quick quiz. It's three questions. It's really simple. Uh, first question, so you answer by show of hands. First question is, how many of you would like to make more money? Good. Very good. All right. So you can get the advanced version. All right. Second, second question. This is to see if you get like the really advanced version. Second question. How many of you would like to live longer and happier? Okay. Good. Good. All right. So third question. This is the hardest question and I don't want you to cheat. All right, so I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. You answer it the same way, so keep your eyes closed. Raise your hands. How many of you enjoy having sex? All right, keep your eyes closed. Okay. All right, now you can, you can now put your hands down. See, small, like, HR audiences get freaked out by that question. But, um, all right, now what if I told you... <laughs> What if I told you that there, uh, if there's three questions, that if you ask those three questions on a regular basis, you'll make more money, you will live longer and happier, and you will have more sex. Would you be interested in hearing a speech about those three questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I have bad news, which is I'm supposed to talk about leadership. Um, but the good news is, if you listen carefully, there are three questions that I'm going to tell you during the speech, and I, I'm, you know, because I'm talking about leadership, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to call it out. You have to listen carefully. But there's three questions that I'm going to teach you during the speech that are the keys to approachable leadership. And those same three questions, if you ask them on a regular basis, you'll make more money, you'll live longer and happier, you'll have more sex. All right? So are you ready to hear that speech? This is about a quest that I've been on. You probably can't tell by looking at me, but I am a nerd, okay? Like a full-on Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings nerd. And so nerds go on quests. And this is about a quest that I've been on for about two years now. All right? And this was a quest that started, I, I have a book that's called The Next 52 Weeks, and I'm rewriting this book. I wrote it about 10 years ago. It's, almost, it's 11 years now, actually. Um, and I procrastinate. So I, you know, I'm coming up with every excuse I can to not write. And one of those excuses was I'm, I got to the leadership chapters and I thought, I have not looked at the literature on leadership in a while. I'm going to kind of dig into that. And at the same time that I'm doing this research and kind of catching up on what's the latest thinking around leadership, I also have this sort of nagging thing about leadership that I've always believed, but I've never really researched, which is that there is some thing and it's not like a class. It's not a uh, you know, particular skill necessarily that is the difference between somebody who is going to be successful as a leader, especially a first level leader, but really a leader at any level, and someone who's going to fail. Right? And we've all probably experienced, I've certainly seen it, where there are some people that they've gone to all the classes, they know the right answers. If you gave them a quiz on leadership, they would get all of it right, but nobody will follow them. Okay, they're, they're just not great leaders. And then there's other people who are pretty ham-handed about stuff of, of the you day-to-day know, -day job of a supervisor, but their people would actually run through a brick wall for those folks, right? They are, just something about them makes them a good leader. And the question that I was asking myself is, what is that thing? Like, what, what is it that's the difference between someone who's going to succeed and fail as a leader? And that was how I started my quest, right? How many of you seen have you have you have seen this equation before? Happy employees equal happy customers equal a better business. Anyone ever seen that? Anyone ever said that? I I said it tons. I wrote about it in my book. That I I talk about this a lot. So there's this idea that if I could just make a, a happy work environment where people. <laughs> people are happy, people are satisfied, that they are going to take better care of my customers, whether those are internal customers or external customers, and if I take good care of my customers, then I'm going to have much better business results. Okay, it makes total sense, right? The only problem with it is it's not true. Um, I, read, I read at least 100 studies on this, 
The problem with these studies is the more that you look at them, satisfaction or happiness, it's a mediator, right? Now, what does that mean? What that means is that you will find studies, there are studies that show that satisfied employees actually perform higher at a better level than unsatisfied employees. Those studies do exist. The problem is, is that there's other studies that show that the correlation or the relationship between happiness and productivity is weak. There's even studies where they find that the happy people are actually produce less than the unhappy people. All right? Satisfaction is not driving the behavior that you think that it's going to drive. All right? And then there's, there are what are called meta-studies. So these are studies of studies. All right? So they collect all these different studies that have, that have studied satisfaction and studied happiness. And as you look at all the different factors that drive performance, satisfaction or happiness is, is very, very weakly correlated, if at all, to higher productivity at work, higher performance both at the individual level, do I personally produce more stuff, and also at the unit level, does my group, does my business produce more stuff, all right? So, you're probably asking the same question I was asking, which is, well, if satisfaction or happiness doesn't produce results, what does? And there's a lot of people that have been researching that. Here's the best answer that I've found. The number one thing, and there's a lot of research that's happening around this today, the number one thing that predicts performance is what's called organizational citizenship behavior. How many of you have heard of organizational citizenship behavior? Okay, so a couple, but organizational citizenship behavior is simply stuff that you do that you don't have to do, all right? So there's things that you're expected to do every day, Organizational citizenship behavior is those things that you don't have to do. There's a guy, Frederick Hertzberg, who wrote um, a famous study in the 1960s that dealt with uh, what motivates people, all right? And he, it's called two-factor motivation, so you've sometimes probably heard of like hygiene factors. This is the guy that came up with all that. And it's based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and the basic idea is that people are not motivated by things like making, you know, pay doesn't motivate better performance, it can demotivate you, but it's not a motivator. That the things that motivate you are these self-actualizing things. And we're gonna look in a few minutes a little more deeply at Hertzberg. But these guys, uh, both of them from England, asked a really interesting question, which is, is Hertzberg's research, is it still relevant today? All right? And they wanted to look at a particular example, and they picked suggestion programs. Right? And what they did is they asked people that had already made suggestions. There was about 3,000 people that participated in the research. They had made suggestions, and then they asked them about what were characteristics that they had in common with each other. And you can see, one of the things they asked, the desire for a money or gift. Did you think you were going to get something, get a reward of some sort, if you made a suggestion? And there was 29% of the people that made a suggestion, that engaged in the OCB, that thought that they might make some money or get a gift, okay, of some sort. 45%, so almost half, said that they had a desire to improve the organization, also to improve their own job. Those two are combined here. So about half the people made the suggestion, thought that it would either make their job easier, make their job better, or would make the company better, all right? So that's quite a bit, about a coin flip. So the third one, my supervisor does a good job, 80%. 80% eight, said if my, my supervisor's doing a good job and they made the suggestion. The first time I read this study, um, I read it. I thought, hmm, that's pretty interesting. It actually never mentions the word organizational citizenship behavior. I'd never, I hadn't really made that connection yet. Uh, I thought, I, I'd read stuff about Hertzberg before. I thought it was interesting. Um, this whole thing about supervisors being important, I kind of agree with, so I, I thought, okay, that's interesting. Um, but that was really it. I took the study, I read it, thought, pretty interesting, put it back in this expandable file with about 100 other studies that I was reading, which might as well have been the Black Sea, and I tossed the study back in there, all right? And I can't tell you why, but some night, and I actually was giving a version of this talk before I had even reread this study. So this stuff is, is, is the new and improved version of this, right? But I pull this study out and I reread it and I'm like, wow, lightning struck. There was one other finding that I kind of glossed over and it was this one. 88% of the people that made suggestions said that their supervisor was approachable. 
all right? Now, there's two things I want you to think about about that finding. The first one is just the number, 88%, okay? So like when you survey dentists about sugarless gum, they do not agree at this level, you know, that sugarless gum is better for their patients who chew gum, right? 88% um, is like unbelievable amount of correlation. That's the first point. Second point, remember eight out of, so 80%, eight out of 10 people said my supervisor's doing a good job, okay? So there is about 10% of these people who say, you know, my supervisor is okay, or not that great really, but approachable, and I made this suggestion, right? So that made me go, what is this approachability, okay? And that's what started me down this path. Now, before I go any further, I want to tell you about this guy. So this is Fred, is his name. And uh, so I, I need some audience participation. So Bill and Jim, why don't you guys hop up here, if you could. Sure. All right, so uh, Fred is the worst manager that I've ever run across, which is actually saying something, okay? So for those of you that don't know a lot about me, come on up, Jim. You, you just, you, you can go over here. <laughs> So for those of you that don't know a lot about me, our, my day job is our company fights a lot of union campaigns, all right? So we are invited to come in to companies that are pretty messed up, right? You're, when your, empl your employees don't wake up and decide they want to bring a union in, things are usually kind of messed up before they reach that conclusion, okay? So we see a lot of bad supervisors. That's, I mean, lots of them, okay? But this is the worst one I've ever seen, and here's why. So Fred, uh, some, a couple things you should know about Fred. First, Fred is the assistant general manager, this is a real guy, assistant general manager of a distribution center in North Carolina, in Charlotte, okay? Um, so Fred also likes football. So he's a big football fan, Charlotte Panthers fan. And what Fred would do, his behavior was, he would come in after the weekend and presumably complain about why Charlotte lost the football game. And uh, he would do this. He would be talking to another supervisor. So you're a supervisor, and we would be chatting about the football game, right? Okay. Sure. And then Jim, would he would drive up in his uh, fork truck, all right, and stop, and he would get out of the fork truck, and he, he would begin to approach. He would, he would realize that we are talking about football, and as soon as he came into the peripheral vision of Fred, Fred would do this, okay? So Fred would, he would not even acknowledge, he would just he would feel that Jim was in the area, and he would do this, all right? Which is why we called him Fred the Finger, okay? So he would continue to talk. We would talk football. It's clearly not a business-related subject. How does this feel? Not good. Yeah, it's not comfortable. About a different right, finger. Right, right. <laughs> right, exactly, right? It may as well be a different finger. Okay, so we would continue to talk about football. This is not what made Fred the worst manager that I've ever run across, okay? What made Fred the worst manager that I've ever run across is his stamina, right? How long, so this became legend in this distribution center. He did this to everybody, okay? Um, he would hold his finger up what, you know, for so long that it became a joke and people actually started clocking him, okay? So what do you think is the longest period of time that someone clocked Fred with his finger in somebody's face. 33 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay, that's the best guess ever. It's, <laughs> it's one minute short, okay? The longest, the longest that he held it up, 34 minutes. Now, my arm is literally like burning off right now, okay? So, uh, now my daughter admittedly has, you know, bigger arms than me, but still. <laughs> Um, out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you both. <laughs> this is my definition of approachable leadership. And you'll, if you think about the examples that we've just given, I think that they fit really well into with this definition. So approachable leadership is about connecting. That's the first thing, okay? You're trying to connect with somebody. And you're doing it by being open. So we talked about, right, the door being open versus closed. 
There's open behavior, getting close to somebody when you're talking to them, looking at them. Those are open behaviors versus closed behavior would be things like, you know, looking off to the side, not paying attention to them. So there's openness. But being open isn't enough, right? You can have an open door, but then when you walk in, you go, oh, great, you know, here's an interruption, okay? So it's also welcoming. So it's not just open, but waving them in, right? Let, you know, at, wanting them to come in, okay? So, so it's openness, welcomeness. The third component is seeking understanding, all right? And, and I've got three different questions that I'm gonna suggest that you ask that will help you accomplish that. But the, but the idea isn't just to have the interaction, but it's to seek some sort of understanding with the person that you're talking to. And what you're trying to understand is their needs, is there something that they need, and their desires, is there something that they want, okay? And then as a leader, we have some resources. There's some things that people want or need that we can't provide, okay? But, but an approachable leader, to the extent that you can provide for that need or provide for that desire, then you try to meet that need and that desire, okay? So it's openness, it's welcomeness, it's seeking to understand needs and desires, and then where it's possible, you meet those needs and desires. That's what an approachable leader does, all right? And I've got three questions that I have that I'd like you to consider that I think are keys to being an approachable leader.